Welcome back to ECE 442-542. In this video, we're wanting to work through a particular zero order hold equivalent, but that's the topic that we're dealing with in this video are zero order hold equivalents. And what we want to do is actually derive the zero order hold equivalent of an integrator. And that will be the last of our goals. First, we'll just remind ourselves of what scenario number two is in terms of discrete equivalence, and that's scenario number two is what we're using to describe zero order hold equivalence. We'll look at a table of zero order hold equivalence, some that we have derived and some that you should be able to derive on your own. We'll go ahead and derive the Z transform of a ramp waveform and that's simply t for t greater than or equal to zero. And if you sample that, you're now looking at this z transform of a sequence in t. So you have t, 2t, 3t, and that's just going up as a function of n. And as I mentioned before, we'll go ahead and derive the zero order hold equivalent of an integrator. We'll do that two different ways. One by looking up the transform relationship in a table and then we'll do it in a more manual way by what I'll say by hand. Discrete equivalence, there's many different ways of computing discrete equivalence for a particular system which the system is typically capital G of S in the analog form or the Laplace transform of some analog system. The zero order hold equivalent is when we actually pre-process this sequence of numbers coming in as an input on the left in this block diagram. They get held constant between each of the sample periods with this zero order hold that then produces this analog waveform that drives our analog plant, G of S, and then we put a sampler on the output of that transfer function or on that plant, and the net relationship between the input Z transformed sequence capital U of Z to the Z transform of the output sequence capital Y of Z is then this zero order hold equivalent and we've already derived that that then is made possible by this product of one minus z to the minus one. z to the minus one represents a delay of one in the z domain and then we need to find the z transform of g of s over s. This zero order hold equivalent then involves a G of S over S in its computation or in finding that particular expression. Here are a few zero order hold equivalents that we have recently derived. If somebody gave you a system, capital G of S, that was a pure gain K, we went ahead and derived that and found that the zero order hold equivalent, the capital G of Z, is in fact a gain also, a gain K, where that's found by finding 1 minus Z to the minus 1 times the Z transform of this gain K over S. The integrator, we will show in this video that the Z zero order hold equivalent of an integrator is kt over z minus 1. k is a gain. k, it's not an index. k is a gain on the integrator. Capital T is the sample period, and we'll find then that the zero order hold equivalent of a integrator gained by k is kt over z minus 1. Previously, we have derived the zero order hold equivalent of a double integrator or a pure mass and that's now this relationship again capital K is the gain T is the sample period we have K T squared over 2 we have two poles at Z equal to 1 and a finite 0 at Z equal to minus 1 
in this zero order hold equivalent of a pure mass. Finally, in this table that I'm providing here is the zero order hold equivalent of a first order system. If you now had a single pole at s equal to minus a and you had a gain on that system of k, then its zero order hold equivalent, you'll get a pole at z equal to e to the minus a t, capital T again is our sample period, a is the minus a where the pole is located and in the numerator of that zero order hold equivalent is really just a constant. K is the gain, A is the pole location or the distance from the pole from the origin to the pole and we have this quantity 1 minus e to the minus a t. Those are then some representative zero order hold equivalents of some let's say classical plants or classical systems, pure gain, integrator, double integrator, and a first order system. Let's now, because we will actually need it in the derivation, the manual derivation of this zero order hold equivalent of a integrator, let's look at what happens when we z-transform a ramp. Here, x of t in the continuous time waveform or version in the analog system is simply t for t greater than or equal to zero. If we sample that, if we slice up the time axis in capital T intervals of time, or we sample now every capital T seconds, we would then have x little x of n equal to little n times the sample period capital T and that's going to be true for n greater than or equal to zero. We want to actually compute now the z-transform of that, and here I'm calling the z-transform of this ramp capital X sub R, where the R is supposed to be standing for a ramp input. We're now taking the z-transform of this time domain sequence, little x of n, where this sequence of time is capital T, 2t, 3t, it starts at 0 at n equals 0 and then it goes up t, 2t, 3t and we would like to know what is the z transform. If we simply plug in that sequence expression, that functional expression for the ramp into our z transform definition, we have nt times weighted by this complex exponential z to the minus n and we're summing that over from n equals 0 up to infinity. Capital T is not dependent on the index n. We can pull that outside of this infinite sum and now it's really more important to find this infinite sum, clo a closed form expression for this infinite sum that I've now indicated in this red box. Can we now find the summation from n equals 0 to infinity of n z to the minus n? And that might look a little intimidating if we just start looking at what that looks like if we look at the series expression. We have 0 plus z to the minus 1 plus 2z to the minus 2 plus 3z to the minus 3 and so on. And it might be difficult looking at that to find a common ratio. I don't see immediately that we have a geometric series on the right hand side. There's nothing that scales each of the subsequent terms in that series expansion. But if we get a little bit more creative and we go back a step and we say no pun intended, but if we go back to the unit step and there the S on the subscript for capital S is supposed to be standing for step, that's now the Z transform of this unit step which is just 1, 1, 1, 1 at each time index little n. Or it's this sum from n equals 0 to infinity of 1 Z to the minus n which really that's just this sum from n equals 0 to infinity 
of z to the minus n. That 1 is just a scaling. Or we now have this series expansion that looks like 1 plus z to the minus 1 plus z to the minus 2 plus z to the minus 3, etc. This one, just to remind ourselves, we can find this common ratio. The common ratio is in fact z to the minus 1 in each of those terms in the series. The actual expression, capital X sub S of z, is 1 plus c to the minus 1, and that just keeps going. If we want that to be well behaved, then we will need that common ratio, z to the minus 1, having a magnitude less than 1. Well, that's now the magnitude of 1 over z less than 1, or if we clear the ratio or the fraction, we have that the magnitude of z needs to be bigger than 1 for that to be a well-behaved series. And we can find the closed form expression by simply getting rid of the tail, and we can do that by multiplying that original capital X sub S of z expression by the common ratio z to the minus 1. We take the difference between the top row and the bottom row, and we now have one mi the quantity 1 minus z to the minus 1 times capital X sub S of z equaling 1. Solving for capital X sub S of z, we now have the z transform of our unit step. That we should probably have memorized for the rest of the semester. The unit step's z transform is z over z minus 1 or written in terms of z to the minus 1, that's 1 over 1 minus z to the minus 1. This is now what we have in terms of a relationship. And we actually wanted an n. That n we can't factor out. That is an index weighting z to the minus n, and we're summing over that index. We somehow want to find capital X sub R of Z's Z transform, and that capital T can come out. That again was just little t sampled at every sample period, capital T. So little t is replaced with little n, capital T. Capital T slides outside the infinite sum, but we have to keep that little n inside. It, here's where we get a little bit clever, and we remember our calculus. If we look at this particular expression, and if we differentiated that with respect to z, we would then have a minus z in front of this z to the minus n reduced by a power of 1. So now let's go ahead and differentiate this unit step, both sides of that, and that will then hopefully produce a term that contains this infinite sum with an n inside this series expansion. Let's then, this is the observation that we're making. We can introduce an n, this is the n that we're trying to introduce into this summation expression by differentiating this expression, both on this side and that side, with respect to z and setting those equal to each other, and we should then find a way to obtain an expression for capital X sub R of z, a closed form expression. That's the goal. Here's our setup. We have the z transform of a unit step, which is the summation by definition of the Z transform. That's what I'm calling the LHS, the left-hand side. That's this infinite sum from little n equals 0 to infinity of 1, Z to the minus n. That we already derived in a closed form manner to be Z over Z minus 1. And for whatever reason, I don't like to use the differentiation of a quotient, so I'm going to go ahead and write this as a product of two terms, z times this factor, z minus 1 raised to the minus 1, and that's what I'll call the RHS, or the right-hand side. What I now want to do is differentiate the left-hand side 
differentiate the right hand side and set those results equal to each other and see if I can now find a way to come up with an expression for that infinite sum. Let's first differentiate the left hand side with respect to z. We're taking d by dz of that infinite sum. We can slide that differentiation in side the summation and simply differentiate each term or taken to, as a total we now have the derivative d by dz of z to the minus one that's a classic differentiation operation we now take down the power which is minus n and reduce the power by one. So now by differentiating z to the minus n with respect to z, we have minus n times z to the minus n minus one. Or we can now separate that minus n into two parts, a minus one times an n, and we can pull apart this z to the minus n minus one into a z to the minus n piece and a z to the minus 1 piece. The z to the minus 1 and the minus 1 are not functions of the index n on our summation and so we can pull those out front and we have minus 1 times z to the minus 1 times this infinite sum from n equals 0 to infinity of n z to the minus n and there's the formula or the expression that we were looking to see if we could find a, an expression for. That now is the derivative of the left hand side of the unit step z transform. Let's now differentiate the right hand side with respect to z and this is just the product formula. We have the derivative of the first times the second plus the first, which is z, times the derivative of the second, and that's minus 1, z to the minus 1, reduced in power by 1, so it's z to the minus 1 to the minus 2, times the derivative of z to the minus 1 with respect to z, which is 1. We factor out a z to the minus 1 to the minus 2 from both of those terms, and that gives us then z to the minus 1 and a minus z. We can clean that square bracketed expression or polynomial up. We have a z minus z. That cancels each other out. A minus 1. And we now have a minus 1 that scales this first expression or factor z to the minus 1 to the minus 2. But that's just minus 1 over, so now as essentially we're going to now end up with this being minus 1 over z minus 1 squared. Let's now equate this result, the right hand side being differentiated, with the left hand side being differentiated and solve for what I've highlighted in blue right there. We now have the left hand side's derivative as minus 1 times z to the minus 1 times this infinite sum equaling minus 1 times z to the minus 1 raised to the minus 2. The minus 1's can be canceled from both sides. We can multiply both sides by z and we end up then with this quantity that we want, this infinite sum with little n weighting z to the minus n. That's equal to z times z minus 1 raised to the minus 2, or z over z minus 1 squared, and that's now what we will be using when we need it if we need to find this a closed form expression for this infinite sum that's in z to the minus n. That's just going to be z over z minus 1 squared. If we remember what the z transform of the unit ramp looked like, it actually had a capital T 
that scaled that series expression. And so now we simply scale what I've starred on the right by capital T. And we now have the Z transform of this ramp is Z capital T, capital T being the sample period, over Z minus 1 squared. That's a result that we are going to need when we start finding the Z transform, the zero order hold equivalent of a weighted integrator. Let's now look at that by using a table lookup strategy. So now we have a integrator It has a gain of k, and the integrator is just this 1 over s piece. If we want the zero order hold equivalent of that, then our formula says we have the quantity 1 minus z to the minus 1 times g of s over s's z transform. And g of s is just k over s, so we now have this 1 minus z to the minus 1 times the z transform of k over s squared. The k we can pull out front because we don't need to worry about that. That's just a gain and we now need to find this z transform of 1 over s squared. Here's where we can go into the table of z transforms. You'll find then if we look at for this table of Laplace transforms that we are allowing for exam number two, here is in fact this 1 over s squared in the s domain that we want. If we simply read across that table, that's now a ramp in the time domain. Here they are using little k as their index. We've been using little n as our index, but that's now just n t, and they are using the z to the minus 1 notation, but we can rewrite that in the z notation if we want. The numerator is still, let's say, t z to the minus 1 over 1 minus c to the minus 1, 1 minus c to the minus 1. It was just 1 minus c to the minus 1 squared. That allows us now to see what happens if we multiplied by 1, where 1 is z squared over z squared. This will now mean that this capital X of z becomes t z squared times z to the minus 1, or that's just t times z over the first z comes through the first factor, and we have z minus 1. The second z comes from the, let's say, right through this rightmost factor and gives us another z minus 1. So this is now the z transform of this ramp, which is this 1 over s squared in the Laplace domain. That's now what we can plug in here. We need the z transform of 1 over s squared. And that now says that we have k, 1 minus z to the minus 1 times, remind myself of what we had, we had tz over z minus 1 squared. And a lot of times it helps to rewrite this 1 minus z to the minus 1 quantity in terms of a polynomial or polynomial ratio in z. So we have k, then we have z minus 1 over z, tz over z minus 1 squared. We can clean that up a little bit by canceling the z. We can cancel one of these z minus 1 factors, and we're left now with the zero order hold equivalent of a integrator that's gained by k being the gain k times the sample period t over z minus 1. So that's now 
the zero order hold equivalent of a integrator that's been gained that's kt over z minus one and we found that from a table lookup let's do one more derivation of that and this one now is actually going to be based on a more manual computation so let's now show how to compute or computing the zero order hold equivalent of a gained integrator by hand or you could say now the manual approach Our integrator is this system G of S. It has a gain of K. And the integrator piece is this one over S. We want to now find the zero order hold equivalent of that. Well, that's now from our development of the zero order hold equivalent. That's one minus Z to the minus one times the Z transform of G of S over S, which is K over S squared. Or this is now 1 minus Z to the minus 1 K, pulling that K out since that <coughs> is just a gain, Z transform of 1 over S squared. And I said we wanted to do this manually before we could just look that up in a table, that Z transform of 1 over S squared. Let's go ahead and convince ourselves that we can get the same result if we did it a little bit more manually. We now have this quantity 1 minus Z to the minus 1 times K, but now we want to Z transform the sampled inverse Laplace of 1 over S squared. And the inverse Laplace of 1 over S squared is this ramp waveform. So now we're wanting to Z transform this ramp that's been sampled And that's what this is meaning. The dashed vertical bars are the sampling operation. So now we want to take the Z transform of this sequence, NT. So now as little n varies, we have 0, capital T, capital 2T, capital 3T, etc. Or we now have 1 minus z to the minus 1k times the z transform of little n capital T. Capital T is our sample period. That's not going to be impacting the indices in our infinite sum in the z transform definition. Let's go ahead and factor that out. Now we have the Z transform of N, little n, or we now have 1 minus Z to the minus 1 KT. And what we have here is this infinite sum from N equals 0 to infinity of N, Z to the minus N. And that, if you remember, is what we derived when we were looking at finding the Z transform of a ramp waveform we found that that was now, we derived by differentiating the Z transform of a unit step, we found what this bracketed expression ends up being, and that was just Z over this quantity Z minus 1 squared. 
we can now clean this up a little bit. Again, this 1 minus c to the minus 1 becomes z to the minus 1 over z times kt. We have z over z minus 1 squared. We can cancel some of these common pieces or common factors. And now we have the zero order hold equivalent of a gained integrator becomes capital K, that's the gain, T is our sample period, over Z minus 1. This is now the zero order hold equivalent of a gained. integrator. Before we leave this, let's just go ahead and examine what this looks like. This is the transfer function of a zero order hold of a gained integrator. Let's go ahead and take that back into the time domain and see what that represents. So here is our transfer function of a pure integrator with a gain. This is now, let's say that we pick a gain of 1, so we have a unity gain, we would have t, z minus 1, so this is now our transfer function between the input u of z and the output y of z, where we've set the k equal to 1, or this is now a pure integrator. We can cross multiply in this expression, and now we have z minus 1 times capital Y of z is equal to t. Again, t is our sample period, the distance in time in seconds between each sample. We now have z y of z minus capital Y of z equaling t u of z. This we can fairly quickly take into the time domain by remembering that z, multiplication by z in the frequency domain is like an advance in the time domain, where we now have little y of n plus 1 minus y of n is equal to t times u of n. Or, solving this for the highest indexed output value, y of little n plus 1, that's now y of n plus t u of n. There's a linear difference equation. We said that that was associated with a transfer function of a pure integrator. Well, what does that really mean? Well, let's go ahead and draw a picture. Suppose now that somebody gave you a waveform u of t. Again, that's not the unit step, obviously, because of this curving nature. But now we can look at that at a couple of different instances of time. Suppose we look at n, and then we look at index n plus 1. So now we've sampled this waveform. This actually has a value of u of n, and this point has a value of u of n plus 1. We've sort of buried the fact that in absolute time, the distance in time between little n and little n plus 1 is this sample period capital T. But one way of thinking of this is that y of n can be thought of as the area underneath this curve up to time little n. Here is now y of n. And y of little n plus 1, if we use the same definition, that 
that's now the area underneath this curve u of n up to time step little n plus 1. And what's the difference between y of n plus 1 and y of n? Well, it's just u of n. It's really just this rectangular region, which is u of n in height times the width, which is capital T. So now we have this difference equation in the time domain. That's where we have this difference equation, which allows us to actually integrate with respect to any particular waveform, let's say u of n, we can find the area under that curve from this very simple linear difference equation. We simply subdivide u of n into slices that are t units of time wide, and we add those up as we step through our time t chopped up in sample periods capital T. So here is a difference equation which allows us to perform actually numerical integration. And we found that by doing a zero order hold equivalent on an integrator. Or what are we doing? We're actually finding the area under this curve given by u of n, and we're doing that numerically. Let's then have that be the end of this discussion of zero order hold equivalent of an integrator. And we now found that if we take that transform description, this relationship between the frequency domain input and the frequency domain's output of this system, which is a zero order hold equivalent of a gained integrator, we can actually find that that's consistent with this time domain integration process, which is found by this difference equation of adding to the area under that curve by adjusting that area at each sample period or at each sample time by this little rectangular sliver. And that's now a numerical integration approach based on or derived from this zero order hold equivalent.